Okay, chemistry time. Today we're talking about covalent bonding and bond polarity. Covalent bonding, let's call it this, covalent bonding acids and, well, we could call it acids and bases because those things kind of go together. Acids and bases and bond polar. That one kind of got away from me. Covalent bonding is probably a better actual title, but this will, this covers the stuff we will all be talking about. Oh, nice. Okay. Yes, that's true. Mm hmm. You want me to write some of this down? What? Let me write some of this down. Yeah, you want to come up here and just do the whole thing? <laughs> no, that sounded rude. Uh, that is sometimes that's something that I think people have done in the past that was rude. Um, let me write some of this stuff down while we're going along. Instead of just you reading what you already have listed, you when we get to something, you um, you you talk about it too. Okay. Well, let's let's start it this way. Peyton is alluding to why do things bond? Why bond? Why would an atom ever bond? What would be at risk of starting to sound metaphysical and? Um, uh, philosophical again like we did in chapter 5 ad nauseum, Peyton threw up. Um, why do people get married? Why bond? Why do we get married? Because of shared, I thought shared yeah but why? That's not, that's a, that's a, that's a, I'm not, there are two things that why can mean. I'm not saying for in what way do things bond and I'm not saying in what way do people get married. That's an easy question. They share electrons in this case. Um, they go to the courthouse and get a marriage certificate in marriage. But I mean, for what reason do things bond? And for what reason do get be to become more stable? Um, greater stability. Greater stability. And as Peyton suggested and, and correctly earlier, um, lower. This is caused by lower energy. Uh, Trying to think of a better there to kind of carry on the metaphor, which actually that's kind of funny because metaphor literally means to carry across. But to carry on the metaphor, uh, there are people who you could think like an like an atom is missing some electrons that it would be more stable with more or fewer electrons. There are some people that either have too much of a of a personality attribute or they have too little of it. And so in order and to get married, maybe. Not always, but ideally, to get married helps them. Uh, yeah, that balances them. That's good. That's good. It, it gives them stability in that they can do things with their partner that they would be unable to do themselves. You know, like uh, maybe I am very poor at running a budget. Which I, I mean, mathematically, I can do it. Like I understand the math. I'm very bored by it. But I end up getting into trouble because I like things. And I don't care about money. And to me, money is a vehicle to buy things. And so I just buy things. And I get into trouble because I buy too many things. And sometimes more things only once. But sometimes more things than I have money. And that's obviously problematic, Dave Ramsey says. And he's, in this case, right. I don't fully agree with everything he says. But in this case, he's right. And my wife, uh, she sees the value in having money, in the stability that having a, a cushion of money can offer. So whereas I see money as exclusively a vehicle in which I can get more things that will hopefully make me happy, it doesn't work, don't try it that way. Um, she sees it as a way that we can be more secure in our lives and not have to worry about things so much. And to do that, you need to have a little money. You can't just always be spending it. And so that's a way in which we balance each other. And that's a very basic way, but that's a way in which we balance each other. And in the same way, um, sodium, back to ionic bonding, bonding sodium, sodium has one valence electron, doesn't it? It's in group one. And chlorine has seven valence electrons. 
doesn't it? It's in group 17. And so both of these can be made lower energy, more stable, by sodiums becoming a cation, and chlorines then becoming an anion, and uh, kind of almost a byproduct of that is that they are held together by the electromagnetic force. Remember? Remember that? If we carry the analogy on even further, <laughs> I said the word byproduct is not going to be offensive to people who are married, but, but my, the, let's say this is my wife. She has more interesting attributes and she's a better person than I am. So my one thing that I bring to the table, let's say for the sake of this, that I am a good cook, which I am, not a great cook maybe, but I'm a good cook and I can do it fast. And that's an attribute when you have a life, when you have a family. And so fast cooking is the one thing I bring to the table. And so I give my fast cooking to her and now we're both more stable. And a byproduct of that is that we have to live together. No, but, he, but the, 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 we are, uh, as it were, without getting too gross, we are attracted to each other by the, I mean, really, by the electromagnetic force, sure. That's true of everyone, remember? Um, we're gravitationally attracted to each other, remember that? But there's also, uh, obviously, an emotional attraction to it. And that's where, that's where we're going to end the metaphor. Um, but you can see the relationship here, that, there's, that there is a greater stability when things are together than when they're not. And that's true of ionic bonding, and it's going to be true of covalent bonding, too. That is, it is true of covalent bonding, but we're going to talk now about how covalent bonding um, causes that to come to pass. So that's an example of a stable relationship. Yeah, so what is, what's co mean? Yeah, you're right. Co means not not just two, but but together. Yeah, together. Together. I just realized this after the many many years of being of hearing this that when the Bible talks about the great commission, the great commission, that is a mission together. And I never realized that before. But a commission, and when we talk about a, a like if I commission a painting of our dog, which I have done recently. I am on a mission with that person who will make the painting. We are co-doing something. So covalent, together. Valent meaning? Valent. Or valent. valent. You can have that, to have that too. Valent meaning referring to? You already know. Come on. What's valent refer to probably? The adjective form of, or the... Valence? Yeah. Referring to the valence electrons, or the valence orbital. Orbital, spelled correctly. So they share valence electrons. They share together valence electrons. So unlike in sodium chloride, where the sodium has given up an electron, in oxygen gas, O2, how many, how many valence electrons will each of these oxygens have? For copyright reasons, I won't play the Jeopardy theme music, but I would if I could. How many valence electrons will each of these oxygens have as an atom? Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, six. Now, instead of, there's really no way that we could do this process with these and make them both happy, right? We could give two of them to this, but then this one's only going to have four. It really isn't any better. Neither of them is going to be lower energy level by giving. This is another metaphor of marriage because you can't, you can't give or get everything. Some things you have to share together. The responsibility, for instance, of raising a child, we share that together. Um, so they share. It works like this. They share, each of them shares two of its electrons so now let's look at this one, just this one. These count as its valence electron. How many does it have? Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, it has eight. And how many does this one have? Okay, it actually has nine because I accidentally circled one from the previous drawing. It has eight, yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So each one shares two of its own, and now they share all together four. They're sharing four. This is, this is a covalent bond, and this one happens to be A double bond. This one specifically is a double bond. So Why is it a double bond? Well, each one is sharing. Two. Yeah, there's two electrons. Yes. No. Well, two valence electrons. No. They are sharing two pairs of electrons. Each one has contributed two electrons. You can think of it that way, but you could also think of it as they're sharing two pairs. Two pairs of electrons. They're sharing two pairs of electrons. 
And I've drawn the electrons like this in pairs, kind of like we draw these, because remember from the electron configuration in chapter 6, 7, 5? Five. Remember from electron configuration that up electrons and down electrons kind of hang out together as a pair. They're the, the crest and the trough of a wave. They're, they're paired together in quantum mechanics. So they always share in pairs. Even if they're only sharing one each, well, they're sharing a pair together. That's, what, that's A bond. A bond is two electrons. A double bond is two pairs, so four electrons. And a triple bond is three pairs, so six electrons. Yes? That's, that's a good point. Let's, tr let's draw that to, out now. Oh, I'm going to erase this. This is ionic bonding. I'm going to erase that. Um, let's draw that out, which is that relating also to energy again, uh, mm, let's phrase it like this. Bond distance is inversely proportional. Remember our CCC proportionality. to bond strength. Bond distance is inversely proportional to bond strength. So big distance means what? Yeah, little strength. A weak bond. A weak bond. It's not the weak nuclear force. It's just a weak bond. They're all the electromagnetic force. It's still the electromagnetic. And that, let's make that clear too. Even though I, I wrote the words, or I wrote the abbreviation EMF for electromagnetic force above ionic, these are also held in place by the electromagnetic force too. This is also, but now it's the electromagnetic force between valence electrons and nuclei, just like it is in an atom. They kind of really kind of behave as one atom. That's one of the things about it. That's why, that's why when we talk about polyatomic ions, the things in a polyatomic ion are covalently bonded. That whole ion itself can bond then with another ion, but the things within it are, are covalently bonded. So this is kind of behaving as one giant atom and the, the electromagnetic force again is holding the electrons to the nuclei just like it does in an atom. But bond distance is inversely proportional to bond strength. So the greater the distance between them, the lower the strength, or we usually express it as the stronger the bond, the closer they are held together. The strongest bond that I'm aware of, the strongest bond in nature, to my knowledge, is that of a nitrogen-nitrogen bond. So in a nitrogen-nitrogen bond, we have two nitrogens. Let's draw it again. Two nitrogens, how many valence electrons will each have? Try again. Try again. Five. One, two, three, four, five. Each nitrogen has five valence electrons. So how will it work? How, how many will they have to share to make, I was going to say the other happy. How many will they have to share to make them both happy? Three. So nitrogen shares, this nitrogen shares its three electrons. So now it still has five, right? And this nitrogen, let me do it in another color. That's another way I sometimes do this to make it clearer. And this nitrogen has also five electrons. So they're sharing three. Another way of expressing this, BT dub, is just with lines as electron okay, pairs. Yeah, These lines represent a pair of electrons being bonded. So how would I redraw my oxygen if that were the case, which it is the case? Uh, it would be Two lines. Yeah. In water, These really should be like this, and we'll talk about why in a second. But and I also wrote down, so this is going from 17, but to form an octet. What's this? Like Give me a second. What's this? H2O. H2O. How can we draw that with our with our bonding lines? Well, we have O, H, like that. Sorry, I drew those kind of close to each other. And why are why are the H's both up there like Mickey Mouse ears? Because there's there's two different hydrogens, but that's not all there is. There's also two unbonded pairs of electrons. Two interesting things about unbonded pairs of electrons is that these always repel each other. All the electrons try to get as far away. Every set of pair of electrons, remember up and down, they go together, crest and trough. Um, they try to get as far away from each other as they can. So they hang out as far away. They're 90 degrees away from each other because there are four of them, and a circle is 360 degrees, so they're 90 degrees away from each other. Um, 
But also, this unbonded pairs of electrons is what gives rise to color. Colored things always have, to my knowledge, at least as I understand color, things that have an inherent chemical color always have an unbonded pair of electrons. What color is water? Blue. Blue. If it's, if it's, in, if it's in just a glass cup and you just look at it, it looks clear, but it's not perfectly transparent. What's, what's, good, what's good evidence that water is not actually perfectly clear? The ocean. Even, yeah, exactly. When there's enough of it together, even if you look in your bathtub, there's a noticeable difference if you have a white bathtub between above the water and below the water. That's not even that much water, but there's a, there's a definite color to it. And Peyton points out in the same way that oxygen is blue. Oxygen has an unbonded pair. Just the oxygen atom, or sorry, we already have one over here. I won't draw it again. The oxygen molecule, as we have it over here, two pairs of unbonded electrons each. That has color. Colorless, and this is not really the point of this lesson, but colorless looks different depending on the state of matter. Colorless gases are clear. They're just completely transparent colorless glasses. All, all of, at least as far as I know, the noble gases are perfectly transparent. Um, colorless liquids are colorless liquids. That's, I mean, that's just the way it is. Colorless crystalline solids, like ionic compounds, look like a clear, like this, this glass, although glass in the same way, no, don't look at the T, but the glass itself looks clear. If you have a lot of it, or even like if you look at it from the side, you can kind of tell on this one, it's kind of hard because there's T in there. But if you look at a window glass from the side, it's green because the color of glass itself is actually Wait, very, very faintly green. There. Actually, these are polycarbonate, so it might be perfectly clear. Um, but colorless crystalline solids look like a crystal that is clear, like quartz, very pure quartz. And then metals, when metals don't have unbonded pairs of electrons, when all the electrons in a metal are bonded, it's just silver. It looks silvery in color. That's why there's so many metals, aluminum, iron, silver, even though silver itself has, kind of has a color, pretty much all of these have no color. But then the metals that do have color, copper, silver, gold. Those ones have unbonded electrons. That's why those are colored. Cobalt. Yes? Well, let's look at it. Let's do one for um, another diatomic one really easy. We have two fluorines, each with seven, as Peyton says, valence electrons. But when you draw it like this, what do we call this kind of drawing, by the way? Electron dot diagram. It becomes pretty clear what they're going to have to do to share. Very, very easy. They're both going to have to share seven. Whoa! No. No, one. Sorry. One. One so would be much easier. Unbonded. No, there's none unbonded. Well, I mean, I guess you could say that there, each one has one three that are unbonded, and that's why fluorine has a color. So this so is how just. Is that not more stable than nitrogen? Um, because it's not sharing as many. The nitrogen is sharing three. Yeah, one line is a single bond. One line is a single bond. Three lines is a triple bond. Two lines. Yeah, they get closer together. The Let me tell you this. The strength of a covalent bond depends on the distance between the bond and nuclei. The distance between the two bonded nuclei at the position of maximum attraction is called bond length. It is determined by the size of the two bonding atoms and how many electron pairs they share. So more electron pairs means a stronger bond, but also it's the size of the atoms. And so a very small or a relatively small atom like nitrogen with a triple bond is the strongest bond. And one of the, one of the um, applications of this is that all the chemical explosives used in the 19th and 20th centuries, t TNT from Minecraft, tri-nitrotoluene. All of the chemical explosives, most of the chemical explosives, use nitrogen because this bond is very strong, and to break it requires, but also it releases a lot of energy. And so when you give the TNT stick a little bit of energy from the fire, from the fuse, the whole thing, like the, the very first one, that bond breaks with the energy you gave it, and then it releases a lot of energy, and that energy is enough to break the next one, and, uh, and there's a huge amount of energy released. Um, what's another explosive? Uh, without going into details to get put on a watch list, people who make homemade explosives, like pipe bombs, usually use um, fertilizer, ammonium nitrate, because fertilizers contain a lot of nitrogen, and they combine those chemically with other substances in order to make a nitrogen-rich combination that has these nitrogen triple bonds that will break and then release a lot of energy. Yes? Um, one of the components of gunpowder, gunpowder is made of three things. Just carbon, like charcoal, 
just sulfur, which provides the oxidizing agent, and then uh, nitre or saltpeter, which is potassium nitrate. Usually, I think calcium nitrate can be used, but historically, how they did it would was the Chinese who first invented it would scrape what's called nitre off the walls of a cave, just kind of the nitrogenated material that has soaked in from the soil. They'd scrape that off the walls of the cave, mix it with sulfur that you could find raw, or you could all, they could also get it out of um, some very basic chemical reactions, and then charcoal, which they, you know, just like burning wood generates charcoal. Mix those three things together in a ratio, I think, if I remember correct, I think it's five to three to one, and I don't remember whether it's five nitre, three sulfur, and one car um, charcoal. I don't think that's it, but I think that's the right ratio. It might be five car char charcoal, three nitre, one sulfur. Anyway, you mix those together and that is like just a, a mixture. It's not even a chemical reaction when you make it. It's just a mixture of those three powders. And then when you light it, yeah. And it's not, it's really non-explosive. It's a, it's a combustive is what that is. Gunpowder itself is non-explosive. It just combusts. It goes whoosh like that. Yes. No, nitrogen share three electron pairs. Um, oh no, We'd, you mean like the the nitrogen halides? That's not even a very common substance. Um, look at the definitions for sigma and pi bonds. It shouldn't really be that complicated. Uh, just look that up on your own. That was vocab words. Do you have questions about the concepts of covalent bonds? Because we really do have to have time to move on to. We don't, but we have to sometime have time to move on to naming. Do you have questions about the concepts before we go on to naming tomorrow? Yeah, basically, on like from a vocab standpoint, where ionic bonding was give and take, covalent bonding is share. That's how I describe it to physical science students. That's the basic of this. Do you have questions about any of this? No. Okay. We'll talk about those. You already know about those, for one thing. Bye.